Hello, good evening, good morning. My name is Srinivas Kunte. I am the Director for Continuing Education and Advocacy at CFA Institute. Welcome to our webinar series. Today's webinar is on the third wave of investing, the world of machine learning and alternative data. In our webinars, we try to cover practitioner learning, state-of-the-art concepts, and innovative ideas. Much of what you hear in these webinars will, may not be found in any books. So I hope you are able to make the best of it. By the way, if you have a considered recommendation on a speaker or a topic, please feel free to write to us separately. Now the topic for today is data science, machines, and the third way of investing. At least in the developed world, more than 50% of the trading volume is now accounted for by machines. A whole new class of investors is actively engaged in the marketplace. But do machines bring better investment outcomes? What skill sets does one need to deal with a machine-centric investing world? Our speaker and expert for today is Michael Weinberg. Michael is the CIO and Senior Managing Director of Moo37 and Protege Partners. Michael is a veteran investor with over 25 years of investment experience. He also teaches at Columbia Business School as an adjunct faculty. Importantly, Michael is a charter holder member and he has been actively supporting CFA Institute work. Now, before we begin, some quick housekeeping instructions. The webinar has a hard stop of one hour, about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation, followed by Q&A. For questions, please don't wait. Do ask hard questions, but try to look at the conceptual side of things. We have a one hour hard stop, but we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. If you have any technical difficulty, please press the help widget. For those who are unable to attend, an archived version of the webinar will be placed on the internet in a few days time. Finally, please do remember to fill in the evaluation survey. We really value and use your feedback. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Michael. Michael is joining us directly from his Wall Street office. Michael, over to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to lessons from the third wave of investing, machine learning and alternative data. It's an honor to be doing this webcast for CFA Institute, an organization I've been a charter holder of for nearly two decades. In this webinar, we'll we will cover the following. How can the confluence of five factors assist with better investing outcomes? What traits are typical of the best and worst third wave managers from an investment due diligence perspective? How does one differentiate between third wave managers and second wave managers, traditional computational finance managers? What are the skill sets and the learning required to become a third wave manager? Alice, why now? First, for those that may not yet be familiar with what Alice is, let me expound. The first wave of investors were discretionary investors, like the Soroses of the world, where I was a portfolio manager earlier on in my career. The second wave of investors were quantitative or systematic investive investors. The third wave of investors or Alice managers. Alice is the confluence of five factors. Those factors are listed on this slide. The first, 
exponential growth of data. The second, data science. The third, machine learning finally working. The fourth, low-cost, on-demand cloud storage and processing power. And the fifth, the information edge is a risk. Now, I'm going to digress slightly. For context, we believe an analog to Alice is Uber, uh, or any of the ride-sharing companies that you may be familiar with. I know in Asia there are some of there are the Ubers as well as the local competitors. Uber, but we'll just use Uber as the example, but the concept still holds. U Uber was a confluence of three factors. One, GPS, or global positioning systems. Two, cellular Wi-Fi networks and phones. Cellular phones, or mobile phones, that is. And three, the Internet. Without any one of these three factors, we would not have Uber or their competitors. Uber disrupted the taxi limousine industry to the point that New York City taxi medallions are down 90% from their peak value. So for example, medallions that were worth in excess of a million dollars are worth $100,000 today. That's how disruptive Uber was. We believe Alice, which is also a confluence of factors, will be similarly disruptive to investment management. Next slide, the quadrants of data. The top left quadrant, structured financial data, is what the first two wave of investors, the discretionary and quantitative managers, relied on. Alice managers employ this data, but they also employ data from the other three quadrants. The data in the other three quadrants, the dark blue, are typically unstructured and or non-financial. This is where we see the excess returns and future alpha coming from. Next slide, exponential data growth. At this time, unstructured data is a multiple of the size of structured data. It's the unstructured data that's growing exponentially. As you can see, the unstructured data, again, is in the dark blue, and the structured data is in the light blue. The unstructured data is growing exponentially, whilst the structured data is much more mature. It's growing, not immaterially, but it's not growing exponentially. And this chart is in zettabytes, and you can see that one zettabyte is more than 4 million times the size of the entire U.S. Library of Congress, which are most of the books that have been written historically. So the, the, the amount of data that, that exists and will exist is obviously unprecedented, particularly compared to how little data there was. The number of data providers has exploded. So this chart shows the number of alternative data providers. There are now multiple hundred of them, and it's growing exponentially as well. These are not data sources. Just remember, these are alternative data aggregators. So for example, if you are on Wall Street or uh, running a, 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 an investment management firm and you were trying to procure data, you might go to one of these aggregators. So don't forget, each of these aggregators represents many data sources, possibly even hundreds. And again, these are, the data, these are data sources from aggregators. This does not include other data sources, such as corporate exhaust data, internet data, web scrape data, corporate, uh, uh, excuse me, government filing data, etc. So you have all this data. Then the question is, how to interpret it? Because unstructured data is, by definition, unstructured. One, therefore, needs a data science platform and data scientists to clean, transform, normalize, categorize, parse, and classify this unstructured data. The first wave of discretionary investors are not typically capable of doing this. 
The second wave of quantitative investors are capable, but often more typically accustomed to using structured financial data. The top left quadrant, as you may recall, the light blue, not the dark, three dark blue boxes. This is a sweet spot for the third wave of investors, Alice managers. This is what they, they are effectively designed to do, use this unstructured and non-financial data to generate alpha and excess returns. So, a question that's often asked is, is the investment game too complicated? Well, our contention is, that's been said before. It's been said before that computers couldn't beat humans in these board games. Checkers, chess, and Go. Go, obviously, being quite, quite popular in Asia. Uh, Gary Kasparov stated in 1987, that no computer will ever beat me. Gary Kasparov then was, if not the, one of the world's leading chess experts, grandmasters. A leading scientist at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Studies believed it would be 100 years before a computer beat humans at Go. It took 38 years for a computer to become the world master in checkers, 12 years in chess, and only six years at Go. For context, checkers only had 10 to the 20th permutations, whilst Go had 10 to the 700 permutations, more than there are atoms in the universe. And since there is, of course, Go Zero, an even more incredible accomplishment. Though we do not believe the investment game is too complicated, it is much more complicated and poses a different set of challenges, which we will discuss shortly. making decisions under conditions of uncertainty with incomplete information. My partner, Jeff, the founder of Move 37, went to Harvard Business School, and that's what they told him they would teach him to do in his MBA at Harvard. Well, our contention, his and mine and ours, is that computers are now doing that better than humans, making decisions under conditions of uncertainty with incomplete information. In 2017, Two universities in Canada and the U.S. beat humans at Texas Hold'em poker. There are two remarkable achievements in this that seem simple for humans but are not for computers. One, there was incomplete information. Cards were hidden compared to the three board games on the prior page where all pieces are seen by both parties. Two, there was bluffing. We joke that computers can now be taught to prevaricate, or lie, better than humans. Though Texas Hold'em Poker is also far less complicated than the market, there are analogs to investing that hold. For example, in investing, one may also want to bluff. In investing, there is, of course, also incomplete information. This isn't a false dawn. Over the prior decades, there have been multiple periods where machine learning has disappointed. Machine learning has been around for 70 years, roughly, since just after World War II. Machine learning results in computers surpassing humans at previously unthinkable tasks are incredible. For example, in an ImageNet visual recognition challenge, the bar chart on this page, computers have a lower error rate than humans for multiple years now. So that's a computer recognizing images versus a person recognizing images. Computers can do it better now, faster and more efficiently and, and, and more accurately. Man and machine, or I should say woman and machine, dominate machine only or person only. In chess, human plus machine are far superior to either alone and claim the vast majority of the top highest rated chess performances. That's what this bar chart shows. Gary Kasparov, who we mentioned earlier a few slides ago, has come around to share this view. Our view is in Alice is that it's the PhD plus the machine that will be the winning combination. 
Plummeting processing costs make machine learning methodologies achievable. Just as data has grown exponentially, processing costs have gone inversely. They've decreased exponentially. So a million dollars of 1980 computing power costs less than four cents today. We know an Alice manager that used so much processing power to generate technical trading signals, it got a call from the NSA to confirm that it wasn't a terrorist organization. That's how inexpensive, inexpensive processing power is now. Whereas decades ago, we did not believe small emerging managers could afford to compete with the largest, more well-resourced managers, now they can. And that is what Alice managers are doing. The third wave, the Darwinian evolution. There's a lot of text on this slide, but we will focus on the highlights. As we previously mentioned in the first slide, the first wave were fundamental discretionary managers, typically MBAs, who generated returns through an information and or analytical edge. Those were portfolio managers like myself at Soros, the Soros's, Tigers, SAC, Point 72s of the world. You may know some of those larger uh, US founded managers. The second wave are the quantitative managers, who are typically PhDs, but using structured financial data. The top left quadrant, you may recall from the quadrant uh, picture earlier in the presentation. The third wave are Alice managers, who are typically PhDs, who use all quadrants of data, so not only structured financial data, but also the unstructured non-financial data, data science, machine learning, and employ a human plus machine philosophy. To reiterate, the skill sets and learning required to be an Alice manager are coding, typically Python or R, data science, and strong investments market knowledge. So in this presentation, we suggested one of the things we would discuss is what one needs to be an Alice manager. And this is crucial, the coding, the data science, and the strong investments market knowledge. If one has all three of those, one has a much better probability of being a successful Alice manager. That said, it's still very difficult and not easy. Investing is, after all, one of the hardest games in the world. Meanwhile, the information edge game has changed. As you'll recall, this was the fifth factor from the confluence of five factors from the first slide. In 2000, Reg FD was enacted to require companies to disclose material information to all investors simultaneously. In 2013, a large fund paid a $1.8 billion fine. In 2014, a portfolio manager was sentenced to prison for trading on material non-public information. Consequently, investors have three choices. I should say first wave investors, discretionary managers. One, back off the edge. Two, pay a fine. Or three, go to jail. As you can see, those are the players from the board game Monopoly, for those of you familiar with it. In a world with those three options, the dynamics are not as favorable for the first wave, fundamental discretionary managers who relied formerly on an information edge. For example, getting better information from company management. However, this lends itself to Alice managers who are not relying on such an edge, who are using anonymized quantitative information. This is a genealogy, or effectively a family tree, of existing quant managers. The slide lists some of the well-known quantitative managers whose flagship funds have closed due to limited scalability of the strategies at high returns. We believe Alice managers will be the next generation of the world's leading quantitative managers. Legacy firms. Here you see a photograph from the early 20th century 
of a horse and buggy, obviously replaced by the automobile. The best Alice firms, in our view, are relatively young. Legacy firms are very old and generally inherently not Alice. Legacy firms are large established firms that have been around for a decade, sometimes even multiple decades. They typically have hundreds and in some instances over a thousand employees. Again, we're talking about uh, second wave managers here, so systematic quantitative managers, but those that have been around for a long time, not using machine learning, not using alternative data. They may have their own in-house servers and storage and often maintain multiple offices around the world. They typically are systematic, as I just mentioned, and rely on academic finance, so fundamental data or old-fashioned technical models, such as trend following or mean reversion, linear regressions, and price volume data. These firms are often very large in terms of assets, minimum of $5 billion, often over $10 billion, and sometimes even over $100 billion. They also don't typically use much, if any, alternative, unstructured, or non-financial data. Shifting gears to CTAs, or Commodity Trading Advisors, we've met many of these that are large and successful who say they're using AI and machine learning in a manner suggesting that they're Alice. Almost consistently, we see the same phenomenon. They have a PhD, or sometimes a few PhDs, focused on machine learning. They have unstructured non-financial data in a research phase, though it is not used in production. Each time when our PhDs in mathematics, machine learning, data science, and robotics met with their PhDs, we came to a similar conclusion, immaterial Alice usage. This is not surprising. They have a or the legacy problem. They're built on old technology, often with monolithic, immense models. They use the Henry Ford, which by the way replaced the horse and buggy model in the early 20th century, pro production technique where each quant or PhD only works on a very small percentage of the model, trading, execution, alphas, risk management, a particular strategy, asset class, or security. It is not in the management firm's best interest for any PhDs to know the whole system, soup to nuts, or from start to finish, for fear of a departure and subsequent replication of the system, which could take the alpha from the, 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 the legacy firm. At the extreme, even if these firms did believe the right thing to do would be to acknowledge that Alice is the disruptive future to existing systematic, quantitative, or trend-following firms, what could they really do? Would anyone be so altruistic as to say we have a legacy problem? That if they could build the system today, they would eliminate much of their staff, close multiple locations, shift to the cloud, use unstructured non-financial data, use machine learning, and return the capital in the interim until they had accomplished this. Then they would need to build a track record to prove that they had gotten it right. This would take at least a year, possibly two or three years, to convince investors. They also are charging very high fees, and we believe they would need to launch at lower fees. So that's unlikely. So legacy firms will continue to do what they were doing, even if it is now outdated by Alice firms, in our view. And legacy firms will use their old models, old systems, large offices, large staffs. We believe they will be disrupted by Alice managers who are smaller, more nimble, faster, cheaper, more efficient, and using the modern technologies. So where's the talent? Though I have a Columbia MBA and teach at Columbia, as mentioned at the beginning of this call, and think very highly of it and other top business schools, let's start with where Alice managers are not coming from, business schools. As Jim Simon stated in the quote at the top of this page, decades ahead of his time, Alice managers are often PhDs or good scientists. They are also often from a counterculture, such as gamers or hackers. 
the nine ones, of course. Just as the counterculture disrupted society a half century ago, we believe Alice managers will disrupt investment management and Wall Street as we know it today. As Clayton Christensen stated in The Innovator's Dilemma, disruption typically comes from the outside. Though some Alice managers are coming from top existing quant funds, many have no interest in those because they would only have the opportunity to work on a small piece of a large model. Moreover, some of the largest quant funds are not even using the most advanced machine learning techniques. Some Alice managers also come from industry. Again, these, this is not old, old industry. This, this, is, this is the fangs of the world, the Facebooks, Apples, Amazons, Netflix, Googles, and top private companies like Palantir um, and, and other similar uh, technology unicorns. So, what have we done over the past few years? Well, that's an old trade map of the world, and we've traversed the globe searching for the best Alice managers. We've gone around the world, including Asia, Europe, North America, researching Alice funds. In fact, one of my partners has, has, has looked for them in India. We've met more than 200 Alice funds, of which only a fraction is listed in industry databases. A few are running over a billion dollars, but the vast majority are running sub $100 million. These are small emerging managers. To use a baseball analogy, which baseball has nine innings, for those not familiar, we believe we are in the first inning of Alice. Now, getting to the funds. An Alice fund must be cohesive. What does that mean? The data, the features, the models, and the portfolio construction must all be cohesive with the Alice manager's philosophy. We will provide more detail on each of these factors momentarily. Time is not interchangeable. What does that mean? In the time between the cat photo on the left and the one on the right, so the cat photo on the left is from Victorian England, the cat has not changed materially, if at all, in over a century. So in over 100 years, a cat looked similar then than it, as it does now. So if one is training a machine learning algorithm to identify cats, the photo on the left is equally effective as the one on the right today. Cats are interchangeable over time, or stationary. However, in the financial markets, this is not necessarily or likely the case. An Alice manager is not likely to get very far with an algorithm trained on century-old financial data. Cat training is commutative, whereas financial data and markets are not. Markets evolve more quickly than they ever have, and cats do not change materially over a century. This is a financial problem that is not prevalent in many other machine learning challenges and makes using machine learning for investing, or Alice, more difficult. Simulation is very hard in the financial markets. What does that mean? This is a small section of the combinatorial game tree for the game of Go. The branching factor, or number of possible moves in any position, is about 200 for Go. Go can simulate games because there are rules, and one can see if the path taken was a good one. Similarly, in chess, there is a finite set of rules and moves. One can simulate which move likely, probabilistically, leads to winning. This compares to financial markets in which simulation is very difficult. An Alice manager can simulate the market a large number of times but not be confident. There is no endpoint as there is in chess or Go to train on. Other machine learning problems don't have to deal with this dynamic. This makes using machine learning for investing or Alice managers more difficult. 
Discovery of Alpha changes the market. Earlier I mentioned a couple of times that I was a portfolio manager at Soros. One of Mr. Soros's theories was reflexivity in the financial markets. You can read about that in his book, The Alchemy of Finance, if you haven't already. Just as in quantum theory, the way observation may impact the very particles one is observing. The theory is that participants' acts affect the markets they are participating in. Selling begets selling, which in turn begets lower prices and more selling. One can possibly see some of this in the first half of this chart. This compares to many other machine learning challenges which are not reflexive and don't change based on the participants. Markets are also potentially nonlinear and non-contiguous. For example, if one looks at the price spike in the middle of this chart, one could only likely exploit that if one was long the security before the spike. Security price spikes or jumps are, are not exploitable in, in once they've already begun. And, and again, one would likely have to have had the position on before that spike to have exploited it. This is another issue not prevalent in many other machine languages where the where the, what's being observed is contiguous and there aren't necessarily jumps or spikes. Here we say known patterns are not alpha. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with factor and um, smart beta and all of those, those, those recent investment trends. The, the top chart is an example of momentum. The bottom chart is an example of mean reversion. These are now considered two common factors. One can access them for nearly no cost via smart beta, ETFs, or factor investing. If an Alice manager develops a machine learning system and merely discovers these two factors, we joke it's a bit like rediscovering the wheel. It's nice, but of little if any value, as the wheel was discussed millenniums ago, discovered, excuse me. There is no need to have a complex system rediscover the obvious. That is the antithesis of Occam's razor, which effectively states one wants to go with the simplest, not the most complex. Alice managers should discover complex, interesting, and novel patterns or alphas to generate returns in excess of the market returns. But should be validation. So, before on the prior slide we said known patterns are not, not alpha, and we're, here we're saying they should be validation. What does that mean? If one's chess algorithm doesn't conclude that one shouldn't sacrifice the queen, it's likely a bad algorithm. For those of you that play chess, you will, of course, understand that. So though the alpha or excess return will not come from the obvious, an Alice manager's algorithm must find the obvious along the way and then build on, on it by including the not-so-obvious. So an Alice manager can discover mean reversion and momentum, but those are not the end games. Those are just a very early step in the journey. Then the Alice manager must come up with algorithms that, that, that find alpha in excess of those that are not easily replicable or, 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 or um, repeatable. So, finding the obvious first helps validate the model. So that's why we say finding the obvi obvious um, but should be validation. In other words, it means you're on the right track, but you haven't reached the end goal. And I apologize if that's at all confusing, because it is not, um, 
it, it is not obvious. So, low hanging fruit already heavily exploited. Just as designing a bespoke pair of sneakers is likely insufficient to get one into the Olympics, searching for alpha on the low hanging branches are similarly not likely to generate excess returns for Alice managers. For this example, we cite price volume or 101 technical data as heavily mined. An Alice manager may ensemble more obvious prevalent or commercial data, such as price volume data with other data, ensemble being combining, but just using price volume or 101 technical data is not likely to generate alpha or excess return. Again, that's heavily mined or very prevalent. Which Alice managers are better? Which ones to avoid? Again, we, we, we use a bunch of uh, Victorian uh, slides here. Uh, the photo in this slide is, of course, a reference to Maynard Keynes' proverbial beauty contest. For those unfamiliar with this vestige of a bygone era, the concept was that in predicting the winner of a beauty contest, it may, may not matter who an individual thinks is most attractive, but what matters is who the majority thinks is most attractive. In Alice investing, we don't care which funds the market thinks are most attractive or the best investments. We care about which ones we believe are the best investments. I suppose one could use the analog that we're happy to be a contrarian. We're not looking to follow the crowd in terms of selecting Alice managers. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, many of the CTAs or legacy firms market themselves almost as Alice managers. They say they use a lot of machine learning and alternative data. But when we do the fundamental due diligence and deep dive research with our PhDs, we find that they are actually, in our view, not. However, Alice managers may select securities that they believe the market will reward in excess of others, and those, and short those that will be unrewarded, thereby generating excess returns in alpha from both the long and the short side. So what we are saying is, an Alice manager may develop a strategy that's effectively like Maynard Keynes' proverbial beauty contest. They may come up with a strategy that, that effectively is choosing securities that it believes the market will ascribe a higher return to and short the opposite. And that is okay. We will next talk about genres of Alice managers, including the best and worst attributes of each. So what make good ones, what make bad ones? Well, acronym soup. Uh, that's, of course, a, pho a photograph of um, a type of alphabet soup, uh, popular with children, in a, at, at, at least here. Um, I don't know how global that is. Anyway, uh, the best Alice managers optimize machine learning techniques and focus on depth rather than superficial coverage. The best Alice managers understand exactly why they use a particular machine learning technique. Though they don't build the code from scratch, they don't just use off-the-shelf code. Rather, they custom tailor the commercial libraries to exactly suit their needs. The worst fall into acronym soup. Though we have named the third wave with our own acronym, Alice, we sensibly took a pause. There is a genre of Alice managers that overcompensates for a lack of substance by asserting they use every acronym of machine learning in what we refer to as acronym soup. A typical due diligence meeting with these managers might go something like this. We ask them, or PhDs, or a research team, what type of machine learning techniques do you employ? And the Alphabet Soup Alice manager would say, we use SVM, PCA, NN, NLP, and KNN. For those that don't know those, those are support vector machines, principal component analysis, neural nets, natural language processing, and k-nearest neighbor. They're different machine learning techniques. There are some top Alice managers who do employ some of these techniques together. 
However, in our experience, again, meeting over 200 managers, the top decile of Alice managers generally are most proficient in one of them, which is their dominant strategy. There is typically an inverse correlation between the number of Alice techniques employed and the quality of the machine learning and funds. There is no machine learning panacea in Alice. Different machine learning techniques are ideal for solving different challenges. This harkens back to the slide where we stated the philosophy must be cohesive with the rest, including the machine learning technique. So if you say to me, you know, Michael, is there a best machine learning to technique to use for Alice? Can I use neural nets? Can I use genetic algorithms? Can I use natural language processing? Can I use k-nearest neighbor? The answer is no, there is no best technique. The answer is it really depends on your philosophy, your data, what you're trying to accomplish, your models, your algorithms, and, and it all has to be cohesive. Back test heaven. The best Alice managers know that history doesn't always repeat itself. What we have here is a chart of data points. And there, it, we have a, 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 a parabolic line and, and a, a multidimensional curvilinear line in green. The, the point here is that in machine learning, one has to be careful not to overfit. Because machine learning inherently lends itself to overfitting. And the, the problem with overfitting is what worked in the past may not or is not likely to work in the future. So the top Alice, decile Alice managers that we've identified all have actual track records ranging from a year to a few years. The actual returns are impressive, not only in terms of level of return, but also due to the quality of returns. They are low beta, high alpha, uncorrelated. They're not predict predicated on easily and inexpensively replicable factors. They're also not long biased or long only. One pays for alpha, not beta. Moreover, um, they're typically small emerging managers with low cost and low fees. The worst Alice managers live in the past in backtest land. The bottom decile of Alice managers usually have phenomenal backtests, but no actual returns. So this is because the returns were typically overfit, like that squiggly green line on the chart, as opposed to the black line, the parabolic one. The disreputable. The best Alice managers have integrity. Um, we've thoroughly vetted our Alice managers. They are with who they say they are. Uh, they do what they say they do. They've been forthcoming with their te techniques um, without revealing the secret sauce. The worst are disreputable. Um, since we're running out of time, I'll, um, I'll just quickly uh, go through um, these slides. Um, so why do you think there's alpha? Um, there has to be an informational edge, a behavioral machine bias edge, an analytical edge, a market microstructure edge, or a regulatory structure edge. Um, and, and the following slides, the informational edge, the behavioral edge, the analytical edge, the market microstructure edge, the regulatory structure edge, these are just examples. Um, unstructured data is a, is a great source of alpha. Um, that's an example um, where one could have used natural language processing to uh, identify alpha in a stock before the market picked it up and generate excess returns. Um, one has to realize that there may be bots or noise in the market. Uh, that shows that the number of accounts challenged, that there are many bots and fake, fake accounts that could impact your investing. Um, there are different, different ways of parsing data using natural language processing. These are a few different types. Again, one has to choose the best one for one's philosophy. Um, the concept, as we mentioned, is humans augmenting the machine learning. Um, Alice frees portfolio managers up to do research, develop new strategies, develop the models, 
hire coders, programmers. The human touch is still required for risk management. Advanced machine learning techniques can be used to create customized portfolios, is what we're saying here. Risk return can be optimized. Again, there's an element of human touch here, um, working with the machine to set risk parameters. And in summary, it's man or woman plus machine plus the data science plus the quadrants plus the low costs that are ours. So on that yes, note. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'll leave the floor open for the last 15 minutes for questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. This was a very insightful presentation. And sorry that, you know, we had to rush through the last. I, I wish we would sit with you uh, on and on. But, you know, there's a one hour. The expectation is that one hour hard stop. There's more than 15, 16 questions. Actually, 20 I'm counting. I try to, you know, uh, get through as many questions as possible. If at all you can, you know, help with the rest of the questions uh, later on offline, that would be, would be very grateful. Uh, let me start. The very first question, you know, with machine learning being used to find patterns and act on information, not necessarily linked to security fundamentals, uh, to what extent does the development of Alice managers contribute uh, only to market noise and less to efficient markets? So essentially, you know, what is Alice about, really? Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, it's a hundred million, sub hundred million dollar uh, managers uh, there in the industry. Are they looking at patterns or are they looking at fundamentals? Where, where does the alpha come from? The alpha comes from finding fundamental or technical pattern, fundament, from fundamentals or technical, and what they're doing is they're doing what fundamental and technical managers, the first and second wave managers did, but they're doing it faster, cheaper, more efficiently. They're using machine learning and alt data, and they can look at thousands of securities, and at, at any given time, and they can look at 10,000 data points per company, for example. And, you know, as a first wave or, a, a, or, or even a second wave manager, as particularly as a first wave, the discretionary managers, they can't look at thousands of companies. They can't look at 10,000 data points per company. So they're doing it faster, cheaper, more efficiently, and discovering what, what discretionary managers have discovered. So they're making them, they will over time make the markets more efficient. Um, and, and take alpha, we believe, in the near term. Go on. Fantastic. So, uh, you know, if you, if you were to uh, uh, kind of give an example of uh, fundamentals versus, uh, uh, versus uh, technical patterns, you mentioned uh, the three quadrants, financial, uh, non-financial structured data, non-financial uh, unstructured data. Is it possible to give one quick example on each uh, fundamentals as, as, as well as patterns? Well, sure. Um, for example, uh, there are managers that scrape the internet for transactional data. Um, and the transactional data can form a mosaic theory, as is taught by the CFA Institute, uh, to determine whether a company will um, meet or beat or miss um, earnings revenues or earnings. Um, another example is um, managers may use credit card data um, again, to determine sales trends, whether they're above or below or, in, or, or how they compare to market expectations. Another example is geolocation data uh, or, or, or uh, data from cellular phones, which shows where people are. A manager may use that data to determine whether certain retailers are more or less busy and will do better or worse than street expectations. Um, you know, there, there are a multitude of examples. Another example is um, oil tanks. Um, a, a manager might use satellite data to look at how fill oil tanks or oil tankers are moving around the world and can use that data to form theories on energy and oil companies or, or shippers. Right. Now, if you wanted to go again to the core of investing, you know, Graham and Dodd and, you know, what Buffett is trying to teach, uh, you know, buying uh, interest in a business versus now, you know, where the Alice managers, how, how do you compare that theory of, uh, or the principles of investing uh, uh, from from uh, Graham and Dot to Buffett, and you know now the Alice managers. You covered that in a presentation slide, but can you ki kind of juxtapose what is happening right now? Is there a philosophy yeah, yeah. change in investing? 
Yeah, no, 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 no. There are some Alice managers. In fact, for example, we know one very well. Um, we know multiple that are based on Graham and Dodd. And what they've said is, you know, let's use, let's use a Graham and Dodd value philosophy, and they may even have a biases towards being, let's say, long value and short what they view as being either expensive or overpriced or not value. And, and they're based on Graham and Dodd. And, the, and so they're doing exactly what we teach at Columbia Business School and what I learned at Columbia Business School, except the difference is instead of it being an MBA with a few analysts, it's a, PH, it's a PhD and it's some programmers and developers and they're using Python and R and code and they are using Bayesian techniques or de uh, and decision trees. Um, and, and what they're doing is they're saying effectively that they, they want to buy what they view are uh, cheap companies based on typical value metrics, price book, price earnings, um, and, and sell the ones that, that are sort of the opposite of value or not value. So, it, you know, Alice managers can use any technique that first wave or second wave investors used, um, particularly first wave like value or growth or, or any of these techniques. But again, the difference is they can look at 10,000 data points per company and multiple thousand securities. If I'm a, uh, like value investing as an individual person, you know, maybe I can look at, I don't know, 50, 100 companies and maybe a few hundred data points per company. So the point is our view is Alice managers can do it faster, cheaper, more efficiently, and therefore they will have a competitive advantage. Right. Uh, so you mentioned that, you know, right now Alice is in the first uh, out of nine baseball uh, games or, or rounds, you know, they're in the first round, if I heard it right. Uh, so in your experience, uh, how, uh, how, you know, how long uh, is the Alice manager's, uh, you know, career? Uh, a trader has got a br very brutish career, uh, for example, you know, two or three years, three years as a successful trader is, is quite a bit. How do you describe an Alice manager in that context? How do you describe a successful Alice manager versus an unsuccessful Alice manager? A successful manage, Alice manager is one that is, uh, has developed a system that works generally without intervention, but that is being improved over time, and it's fully systematic, and it generates uncorrelated or orthogonal returns to the market. Um, top Alice managers have returns that have no correlation to traditional long-only hedge fund uh, indices. Um, they are truly generated based on alpha, not beta, in our view. Um, and, 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 um, and, and you can measure that. You can run the correlation statistics. You can, you know, you can, you can, you can run all that. And you can, and you can look, and you can also obviously look at the level of returns. And so, and, and, and that's what we like to see in successful Alice managers. Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of like asset classes, are there any, is there a bias there? Are they predominantly equities or is it fixed income? Uh, is it uh, in a particular marketplace? You mentioned you showed the graph, you have toured around the world. Is it based in the U.S. or more illiquid markets? Where are you seeing most of the people coming from and where is the fastest growth? Well, to be honest, um, we're seeing many, most of the house managers at the moment in the U.S. and Europe, um, all over the U.S., um, Boston, California, um, uh, in the South, um, uh, Silicon Valley, San Francisco. Um, in, in Europe, we're seeing them in Germany, London, uh, even Scandinavia. Um, I've met with Alice managers in, in, in Asia. I mentioned um, my partner in India and, and myself in, in Japan and Singapore and a little bit in China. Um, but, yeah, look, uh, we, we think we're just at the beginning of this. We think it's really the first inning. Um, uh, it, it, the, previously, Al so historically over the last couple of years, most Alice managers were using equities, ETFs, and futures. Now, and, and we thought it would be years before they were in credit or municipal bonds or other more illiquid strategies. Now for the first time we're seeing them in municipals, we're seeing them in investment grade credit, we're seeing them in um, illiquid strategies. So it's moving much more quickly than we expected. We, we understand that there's some Alice being used in private equity, though that's not where we're focusing. Right. So you mentioned this word disruption. How would you describe uh, what will disruption look like in the marketplace if, uh, you know, if you go to the fourth inning of Alice and, you know, uh, the final in innings of Alice? Well, I think the disruption would be that the first wave of investors, the discretionary managers, like what I used to do myself, 
their returns will continue to diminish and um, their, excess, their alpha or their excess returns will diminish um, because their alpha will be taken by these Alice managers who basically just said, let's do what they do, but let's systematize it and do it faster, cheaper, more efficiently. And, you know, um, and, and so I think that you will see a, a, a further decline in discretionary asset manager returns over time. And then, and, then, and, and then in addition, I think the second wave, those legacy firms or quantitative firms that don't use Alice, will also see a potential diminishment, or excuse me, di diminution in their returns. Right. Now, you know, if somebody wanted to set up a, a Alice shop, uh, what, does, uh, what does it take? Uh, let's say in U.S., uh, you know, you mentioned PhDs in finance or PhDs from other fields as well. Uh, well, basically the requirement of being a scientist. But what if, you know, somebody doesn't have the PhD? Can you please uh, touch upon very briefly on the personal skills as well as, you know, the money required to set up Alice shop? Yeah, look, what it takes is, first of all, it's a PhD. It's actually not usually finance. Most of Alice managers have PhDs in um, other subjects like statistics, um, machine learning, robotics, data science, uh, epidemiology, physics, um, electrical engineering. These Alice managers, they're not the PhDs in finance, economics typically, or, um, or, or finance or economics. Um, but in any case, so one needs, a, I would say at the least one is typically needs to be a PhD. One has to be comfortable and with, with, with signal to noise and dealing with large amounts of data. And um, one has to be proficient at coding. And one needs to understand markets and investing. And how about, you know, what is the kind of money required to set up Alice Shop? Does it uh, require, oh. you know? No, yeah, the, the, no, that's the whole point. It's become democratized. Our view is you don't need large amounts of money. If you're just creative and clever, you know, with web scraping, you can, you can get phenomenal forms of data on the Internet um, with, with record low processing and storage costs because of Amazon Web Services and other cloud computing. You can process immense amounts of data. You don't need to buy a supercomputer. So our view is this can be done very cheaply and inexpensively and cost efficient. All you need is a PhD um, and, and, you know, uh, and, and, and creativity and, and, you know, again, maybe a programmer or developer. Um, then obviously there's a business side if you want to market it. You know, you might need a CFO. You might need a marketer. Um, you, you know, you might, you, you know, but, but, but to, to, to create the strategy, we believe, you know, it, it can really be the proverbial one man and a dog. Right. So we've got two minutes left, uh, uh, Michael. I mean, if you can give very briefly touch upon three questions, you know, how is regulation shaping up? Uh, if you can briefly describe your own, you know, selection process. Uh, you mentioned you do due diligence and your own research. You've got PhDs doing it. Uh, that's the second question. So regulations, your own process of selecting Alice managers. And the third is, you know, for our listeners, you know, uh, what should they do to become Alice manager in terms of recommended reading? Where should they go and look at? Okay, so first of all, for regulation, that's easy. Um, I've spoken to some regulators. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not as sophisticated generally. They're viewing it as quantitative trading. They don't view it as the next generation or the third wave. Um, so I think they're looking at it as though it's quantitative trading. Um, second question, resources. That's easy. Go to the website, our website, www.move37mov37.com, because on it, in the ex machina section, we have three sections. We have, uh, we have like a bunch of articles, thought papers, thought leadership, uh, interviews, podcasts, things we've, we've done. Then there are two other sections, through the looking glass and down the rabbit hole. And in through the looking glass, it is very high level, books and courses on machine learning, and in Down the Rabbit Hole, it has very detailed books and podcasts and courses on machine learning. Um, and, then, and, 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 and then actually, I'm starting the Artificial Intelligence Finance Institute, which will be in New York to teach, to teach this, Alice. But in any case, the third question, our research process. Our research process, so we have MIT PhDs who really drill down to the level of code, the machine learning, the statistics, the science behind it. Um, we, 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 we've created two rating systems, a first more discretionary, a second more systematic. We're actually using some machine learning to rate the managers now, um, which we think we're the first in the world to do. Um, uh, I think we're probably out of time. Is that right? No, that's fine. I mean, just a minute or so is fine. What's that? 
I mean, if you have, if you have got one more minute to say, that's fine. You know, we can, you can yeah, okay. continue. Uh, yeah. So look, um, you know, look to to understand these managers requires, um, you know, being a PhD uh, in, I would say, in 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 you know, and and having a that 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 level of understanding of 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 um, of, of of statistics and data science and computer science and um, and machine learning and 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 then one also has to again to understand them has to have the finance and investment uh, under knowledge. Um, we, we've also created bespoke visualization tools, uh, in other words, to analyze their trades and understand them. Um, I mentioned we're using machine learning to understand them. Um, you know, it's it, you know, this is all uh, you know, just as what they're doing is complex. Understanding, evaluating them is is similarly complex. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll pause there. No, no, no. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. This was an extremely insightful presentation. We have a record audience to you know listen in uh, on this uh, presentation. Those who have not uh, had the chance to log in, probably they'll come and log in in the uh, in the next few weeks uh, and months. Uh, just to remind our uh, audience that you know on October 17 we go to a completely different topic: investing in India's fast-growing illiquid securities market. Uh, thank you again, listeners. Thank you very much, Michael, for coming in. Thank you very much to Christine as well uh, for helping us out on this. Uh, Michael, please convey our thanks. Uh, we'll close over here. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye, everyone.